let's get started. So welcome to this uh, Institute seminar series. We're really glad to have a very distinguished uh, Dr. Edward Foster from UPRC to begin to give us a very, very exciting talk. So Dr. Tonstow received BS and MS from Howard University in DC area and a PhD from University of Mexico, Albuquerque. Uh, so after that, we went to JPL, Jet Promotion Lab in California, and then to APL, a participant from John Hudson, and then joined the UPRC. Now he's a director, associate director of robotics at UPRC. And he has been working on robotics for long, long, long time. So Robotic was not very popular at that time. And he started with a very impressive uh, career. Very, I think he will, he will tell that during the seminar. Let me not, don't say too much. Uh, I met Dr. Tanska during the February, actually, technical and peak board meeting, where we introduced each other. Here's from person from the UTRC. I said, I've never seen anyone from the UTRC and I'm taking technical activity board. So I talked to him afterwards, turned out he's quite new today. So uh, I also have the president of IGB System Learning Cybernetic Society, which our director, George Bolas, joined that a few years ago. I don't know you know that. I didn't know that, no. And we have a very Old tradition of socialist uh, SIC, so it was added in chief, and also um, the title was, uh, I don't know, what's this one? He was the fellow of the Clippers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. He was also the PTO. So mm -hmm. we have some technical connections, and also yeah. we have the new journal. So without saying too much, this article is titled Mo Mobile Robotic Explorer. Moving throughout the solar system, that's really very exciting for me. Thank you very much, Peter. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I uh, hope you're enjoying the, uh, the lunch. I hope to give you some uh, in interesting information of a technical variety, but more of what I think is something that we don't talk about every day or even every week or in many cases, certainly not even every month. Uh, the idea of exploring planetary surfaces using robotic systems, and in particular, robotic vehicles. Uh, as was mentioned, um, I used to work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I was there for 18 years, uh, helping to develop this kind of technology uh, for hopefully one day actually doing something like the missions that are going on right now on Mars. Uh, was there long enough to actually see that come to fruition get an opportunity to work with a lot of scientists from around the world uh, in making that happen and turning, having it turn out to be a pretty successful mission. Uh, what I want to talk about is not just the work that goes on at JPL or even at NASA, but really sort of worldwide. You know, how much have we really done in this area of uh, planetary exploration using robotics? I'll try to give you a sense of that as well as some of the things that uh, folks are contemplating, trying to use robots on other types of surfaces that we haven't visited yet, uh, give you a sense of what the state of the art is now and what some of the mission concepts are. And uh, hopefully that will you know, give you a fair appreciation for what people are very busy with on various occasions, not only in the United States, but around the world. <coughs> so this is a brief outline. Uh, and with each of these bullet uh, items, uh, there's a good amount of material. I'm going to try to get through all of it. I want to try to respect the time and talk for about 40 minutes or so and allow an appreciable amount of time for uh, Q&A. Uh, if anyone is keeping time, if I violate that severely, please let me know ahead of time, and I'll try to, try to uh, wrap up pretty quickly. All right, and so I'm going to talk about current technology, state of the art. <laughs> what are we already doing? Uh, first thing you should realize is that a lot of times the things that are operating out in deep space when we say state of the art, it often is behind state of the art of the things that we often use here on Earth. There's a number of different reasons for that. One of the keys is 
electronics and computing. Uh, the, the electronics and computing that we use in our systems here on Earth uh, won't survive, in most cases, the radiation environments and so forth that some of these systems are sent to. And so we're sort of leaning on old, old technology, but also there's another supply and demand type of issue in that the big producers of, for example, computing chips, Intel, Motorola, etc., they don't have a demand for chips, processors that are radiation-hardened and useful in space, in deep space for that matter. And so they don't mass produce them. And so a lot of times when you do space missions, you have to either take something off the shelf, radiation harden it yourself, or build your own ASICs, uh, application-specific integrated circuits. So it's an interesting a niche domain where you have to be somewhat creative. And uh, not only that, you have to make your systems as lightweight as possible. Too many mechanical moving parts is not a good thing. There's a lot of different constraints that go into making these systems work. And maybe I'll give you some appreciation of them. We've been to Mars. We've been to the moon. Robots have been to some asteroids. Robots have been in orbit at Mercury. Some robots have touched the surface, surface of Venus. But not much of the surface and not for very long. I'll try and give you a sense for what's behind some of that. And then what are the technology and capability needs going forward? These things are relatively constant as the decades go by because as technology improves, the capabilities that are needed for certain types of space missions still remain the capabilities that are needed for certain types of uh, space missions. And until we do those missions, we haven't really realized the, the capability. So that list is fairly constant, and then I'll give you a sense of that as well. And then we'll have some Q&A. Firstly, this is a nice, interesting chart. Uh, you have to stare at it for quite a while to really appreciate it, and some of the text on it is not legible from where you're sitting. But I'm using it here just to give you a sense for what it's about. Um, these are our deep space mission flight paths over the years, not just the United States, but pretty much anyone who has sent a spacecraft into deep space. And what it's showing you, you've got the sun up in the upper left corner, and the first object, uh, you, you see these digits that I've put there, they're next to actual planetary bodies. And so that nine uh, next to uh, uh, the sun, basically, is indicating a number of missions that have been flown by some robotic or unmanned spacecraft. Then you've got Throughout the solar system, you've got Mercury. So how far away are they from the sun? Did Say again? How far away from the sun they flew? Oh, that's a good question. Well, it's, it's, it's variable uh, in, for, for different missions. But none have gone any, any, uh, any closer than, what is it, about uh, a fraction of an AU. A fraction of an AU close. Uh, the A1 AU being the distance between the sun and the Earth. So that some have got fairly close. Uh, APL, in fact, by Physics Lab, is working on a spacecraft mission right now called Solar Probe. This will be the one that gets the closest to the sun ever. Their major design challenge is a particular heat shield uh, that's supposed to keep the electronics and everything else in constant shadow, no matter how close they get to the sun. It's a pretty challenging engineering feat. Uh, but that's coming up soon. I think they launch probably, I can't recall if it's this year or next year. All right, and so it's basically showing you uh, Mercury, Venus, Earth, Earth's moon, Mars, the asteroid and comet belt, Jupiter, and so on. And those digits indicate how many spacecraft have actually been sent over the years. So as you see, we've been doing some things. We've been flying by mostly in terms of our exploration. In some cases, we have orbited and taken data, made maps, gotten imagery, and in rare cases, we've actually landed. So I'm going to talk primarily about those cases in which we've actually done some landing and some exploration. First, a minor distinction. A lot of us... Can you go through what the names of the various uh, things are here? The names uh, of... Of the planets. <laughs> oh, yes. I, yes, I mentioned... Uh, so, yeah, Sun. And you've got uh, Mercury, okay. Venus, <clears throat> Earth, Earth's moon... Mars, the asteroid belt, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus. Did I skip one? 
Neptune. Neptune, and then Pluto. And yes, we finally got to Pluto a few years ago. <laughs> After nine years of travel in the spacecraft that's flown the fastest ever. <laughs> okay, so a minor distinction. Uh, we often refer to robotic spacecraft. And now that robots and unmanned systems are becoming terms that we use pretty pretty much every year, very often, uh, we like to try to distinguish. And most of the spacecraft that have flown those missions that I showed you on the previous chart have been what I like to refer to now as unmanned spacecraft, right? Uh, and that distinguishes them in a number of ways. Uh, the way that I'm trying to make the distinction is that they do not have appendages, mechanisms that touch the external world and manipulate contact, or anything like that. They're basically sensors that fly around and move around through space. Another distinction has to do with the human spaceflight program. So these are not part of the human spaceflight program, therefore unmanned. And then I like to refer to space robotics or planetary robotics in the sense that these are systems that touch their environment in some way. They rove on the surface, they land on the surface, they manipulate the surface with, a, with a arms and hands and that kind of thing. So we're going to be talking primarily about planetary surface robots, those things that are on the uh, bottom of the slide here. All right, firstly, in a very high-level sense, how does NASA and other space agencies go about their business of exploring uh, planetary surfaces? This is a general chart that kind of describes it uh, in a sort of high-level way. It's basically a campaign over many years and multiple missions where we seek, we explore, and ultimately we might sample. We've done a lot of seeking. Most of those uh, missions on that first chart I showed you are seeking. They're doing reconnaissance. They're trying to learn about the planetary environment, potentially the surface. And the more we learn, the more we can uh, apply new designs to systems that might actually land on those surfaces because we know a bit more. So a, a seeking phase or reconnaissance phase has been going on for decades. The exploration phase, we've really just recently begun with the rovers that have landed on Mars, some of which had already landed on the moon and that sort of thing. And we're, like I mentioned, we've yet to actually sample, except in one case, one Japanese uh, spacecraft uh, sampled a very, very small portion of an asteroid surface and brought that sample back to Earth. Other than that, we haven't done any sampling, sample returns uh, on any missions yet. Okay, the whole area of planetary surface robotics, I try to sum it up on this slide. Basically, it's the development of robots that are capable of performing tasks in extreme planetary surface environments. Examples of the tasks that they might do involve exploration. That's what we've been doing of late. Inspection, servicing, maintenance astronaut assistance, assembly, construction, none of which we've done yet. But these are the types of things that the planetary uh, exploration programs around the world are ultimately trying to get at. And so this technology development ongoing all the time, trying to get us to the point where we're ultimately using robots to do some of those latter uh, tasks. Mission capabilities that these things tend to need in order to accomplish what they, they're sent, to, sent out there to do are kind of listed here, very high level, not entirely uh, uh, inclusive. But they generally tend to have some sort of science instrument or more. Their job is to deliver those in instruments to multiple and different locations on the surface in order to get a variety of measurements for the type of mission they're trying to do. They're intended, usually if they can, to cover large areas over benign sometimes, but also extreme or hard to access terrain. Hard to access meaning cliff faces, for example, uh, the insides of caves uh, in an underwater ocean, if you will. They're meant to eventually perform physical sample acquisition so that we can actually study either in situ on the surface or bring back to Earth to study in really complex and very thoroughly equipped laboratories, the samples that are returned. In some cases, they'll require dexterous handling 
and processing of those samples that they can uh, actually acquire, and eventually the return. And beyond science robots, those robots that are exploring for the purpose of gaining science data for us to analyze, eventually there will be utility robots that are basically service robots that work in support of human endeavor towards exploration or in preparing an area for human habitation, for example. So far, these robots have been controlled directly via teleoperation, primarily to the moon, or remotely across substantial distances in comms with time delay via semi-autonomous control. What I mean there is that a portion of the day's activities are at one moment communicated to those robots, and then they're off on their own for some number of hours to perform their task until the next communications opportunity occurs, and we find out down here whether or not things went the way we intended them to and what we need to do if not. Okay. Every yes. 45 minutes, you get a chance, right, for Mars? No? Say again? Every 45 minutes or so, you can have access to it? Or That's not? right, and it depends. So Mars these days has now a network of uh, orbiting satellites. Okay. And so that provides, in some cases, a bit more frequent interaction. Uh, so it kind of depends, but it's never approaching the uh, small time delay that's useful for teleoperation. All right, so some of the key capabilities, and these are broad general categories here. Mobility, <clears throat> manipulation, the ability to survive in the environment that they're sent to, and the, the, the ability to accommodate the time delay. And that comes down to whether you're at, dealing with a particular communications link or your mode of operation for the actual mission. What is the cadence of communicating to the vehicle or the robot versus when that robot sends back data and you can actually turn around a new command. So all of that is variable across different missions. These mission-driven desired capabilities that are repeated from the previous slide except for the last one. What we're trying to achieve often is maximum capability or functionality as the systems degrade over the course of long duration missions. So, so far the missions have been relatively short. The Spirit and Opportunity rovers at Mars, their missions have been uncharacteristically long. They were designed to do a mission for about three months and it's been a decade <laughs> and more for both, both vehicles. Uh, and so now future rovers, of course, are intended to also last for longer periods of time. Curiosity, for example, at a nominal mission duration uh, of one Mars year, that's about two Earth years. Now, if you're going to be sending these systems up there where we can't go and intervene and fix things and so forth, uh, they have to be able to not only survive the environment, but their capability over time has to persist to a certain degree in order to perform an appreciable mission. And that comes down to primarily hardware. If hardware degrades, maybe even something breaks, it would be nice and interesting if we could actually get those systems to maximize their capability under the injury, if you will, that they have. When it comes to computing, it's not too bad because we do have the capability to upload new software through extremely slow communications links. <laughs> All right, so, so far, there's been a lot of space probes, spacecraft, unmanned robotic spacecraft uh, that have been flown to various missions throughout the years, and they're listed here. Uh, and then the planetary surface vehicles and landers are listed at the bottom. The most recent ones that you might be familiar with, MSL, that's the Curiosity rover. MSL stands for Mars Science Laboratory. That's the name of the mission. The Phoenix lander, you may have been aware of that. MER, that's Mars Exploration Rovers. That's our spirit and opportunity. Uh, prior to that, Mars Polar Lander. And then prior to that, Sojourner. Now, prior to that, I'm looking at the, uh, I'm guessing the age of most of the, the students in here. And I'm going to guess that most of you had not heard about the prior missions. The Pathfinder there. Okay. Viking. Anyone? <laughs> uh, Mars 3. That's more, even more unusual. So right around the time that the uh, Apollo mission was going on, uh, the Russians were already sending things to Mars. Uh, they sent a couple of spacecraft, Mars 1 and Mars, Mars 2 and Mars 3. Mars 2 failed. Mars 3 got to the surface, 
but only lasted for about 60 seconds. Uh, so it, it gains a, a spot on the chart. <laughs> it made it to the surface. Does anyone recognize this uh, device? This is what I would call the first Mars rover. This was the rover that was on board the Mars 3 and the Mars 2 spacecraft that the Russians sent to Mars. It's called Prop M. This is early 1970s when they sent this vehicle. It would have operated with a 15-meter umbilical tether to the lander that got it to the surface. It had tactical, tactile obstacle avoidance bumpers, and it had this sort of ski-like locomotion capability because they anticipated the surface, what we knew of it at that time, to be sandy and that sort of thing, and they figured that this would work well. And it had a couple of science instruments to measure the soil density and the, the penetration uh, strength of the soil. Were they publishing this stuff for, for years to know how to do it right? Not, not on a scale, a sort of global scale where you might uh, really hear about it. Uh, and in particular, when it didn't ultimately succeed, right. uh, you might not hear about it. And so I learned about these rovers in, within the past decade. <laughs> Just to give you a sense. <laughs> uh, it turns out this one, uh, one of these is in a museum in, uh, in uh, St. Petersburg. So is that after Russian declassified information? I don't know. I don't know when the information became available and why. Just that uh, I suddenly became aware of it, looked into it a bit to understand that it was real, and, uh, <laughs> and left it at that so far. Okay, so on this chart are illustrated all the rovers that have operated on planetary surfaces uh, to date. Uh, the first one on the bottom uh, left here is the Lunokhod. There were two of them, two Russian missions sent to the moon. They actually teleoperated those vehicles from the surface of, uh, of Earth. You've had the uh, lunar roving vehicle that the astronauts, the Apollo astronauts, actually drove on the surface. Sojourner, Mars Exploration Rover, Mars uh, Science Laboratory. So opportunity and spirit and curiosity. And then, most recently, uh, the Chinese uh, government has sent, on their Chang'e mission, the rover called U-2 to the moon. And it lasted, it actually drove on the moon for some tens of meters before it lost mobility. It was able to be communicated with, so it wasn't totally lost, and it was able to take imagery and some data. Uh, so they got somewhat of a mission out of it, but uh, it wasn't fully fulfilled in terms of uh, the mobility that it would have been able to, to perform. It even had some relatively advanced uh, path planning cap cap capabilities on board using particle filters and such. OK, so I'm going to go through this by so almost like planet by planet. Let's start with Mars. Um, this is a spirit before spirit left Earth. I've annotated this so you could get a sense for a lot of the different components on this vehicle um, that enabled the mission, uh, starting with the mobility system, as you can see very clearly, six wheels, uh, all on the rocker bogey mobility system. This is a very articulated mobility uh, system that allows these robots to travel over very rocky and rough terrain without the body actually tilting and swaying and, and so forth. It's the body stays relatively level while the wheels basically follow the contour of the terrain. It has a bunch of different pairs of cameras. Stereo vision is its primary means of seeing the environment. Uh, has two in the front, two in the back, four in the masthead at the top. We call them navigation and panoramic, panoramic cameras. Let's see, the robotic arm. This one has a four degree of uh, freedom of robotic arm with a end effector that doesn't grab anything. It has science instruments on it. So you place those science instruments onto rock and soil and you get data. It has one particular device that does scrape at the surface of rocks because the, on Mars, the surface material, particularly rocks, are weathered for many, many millions of years. And if you're measuring the very surface, you're probably not getting at the actual composition of what the rock is made of. So there's a desire to scrape off 
some of that weathering material and get at the actual material. It's primarily powered by solar arrays, which means that it's very likely that such vehicles will be sent close to the equator of the planet to get maximum sun. And then it's got a series of antennas for communicating. Low gain antenna, high gain antenna. The high gain antenna was actually used early in the mission to communicate directly to Earth from Mars as long as Earth was in the Mars sky at the local location, surface location. Later, the orbiters that I mentioned are circling around Mars were used more as a, an asset and the low gain antenna was being used to communicate to them and they would relay uh, data back to Earth. Commands would come in the opposite path as well. Of course, more energy was used with the high gain antenna and so that was sort of, sort of a, a mission operations trade off. Okay, the arm, as I mentioned, uh, carries a number of instruments. In this particular case, because of the mission and what the rovers were designed to do, it had a particular suite of instruments, an alpha particle X-ray spectrometer, a microscopic imager, it's basically a camera for which the images that it takes are magnified. So you can take a picture of a, a clump of dirt and what you see on your screen, once you get that picture back, those grains of uh, soil are enlarged. So it's almost like a small microscope. Moss power uh, spectrometer, uh, basically measures the amount of iron content in what it measures. Gives a sense for potential past water activity. And then a rock abrasion tool. That's the tool that actually scrapes at the surface and tries to get the weathering off. Okay. This is a, 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 a video. You've probably seen this before. I won't play the whole thing. In fact, I'll probably speed it up. But uh, this is just to give you a sense for what these missions are pretty much like. <clears throat> okay, there's some sound, but it's not intended to, I don't really need the sound to, to talk about this. Uh, so basically, uh, you've seen the size of the rover. If I had Spirit up here, it would be it would fit in this space right here. And the mass would be up about here. That whole thing is folded up to some degree in the fairing or the cone at the top of that uh, rocket. And so to get that amount of mass off the surface, all of that rocketry <laughs> is needed to get it uh, at least high enough to put it uh, beyond, uh, basically into low Earth orbit where additional things can take place, like these rockets, uh, these uh, solid rocket boosters, they actually spend their fuel and they get jettisoned back out into the ocean and we go out and pick them up and reuse them. And then various stages of the rocket separate until finally you get a final boost a little further out and the fairing opens up and deploys the actual spacecraft. So everything you've seen so far is not the spacecraft that flies to Mars. <laughs> It's the rocketry that gets the spacecraft out to a point where it can launch itself, if you will. Now, this particular mode of actually launching into space is similar to when you throw a football and you want to get a nice spiral on it, or you shoot a basketball and you want to get a nice spiral on it to get sort of that fine trajectory that doesn't wobble around. So this thing gets spun up to a certain number of RPMs. The final stage separates and it can go off to Mars. Now, in this particular case, this mission, that uh, travel time took about seven months. And we usually make those launches when Earth and Mars are closest together in their orbits around the sun. Okay, so seven months later, entering into uh, the Mars atmosphere, the cruise stage is jettisoned. That conical shape on the front there acts as a heat shield so that the rover doesn't burn up when going through the Martian atmosphere. Even though it's thin, it can actually burn up uh, your hardware. And this particular approach to landing deployed a parachute to slow down the actual descent to the surface. There are altimeter instruments on board, so it's constantly measuring the distance to the surface. And at a certain point in this particular design, the heat shield will get jettisoned, and you have this apparatus, the lander, inside that deploys on a bridle 
still sensing the distance to the ground. The thrusters are fired eventually, and this happens. And I like to refer to this as the uh, very expensive egg drop experiment. All right, so the bridle gets cut, and the whole system just bounces until it stops. Now, those airbags get deflated. The lander opens up. It, there's a preferential surface on which that lander should land, uh, the bottom, so that this all works very well. It's no guarantee that after it finishes bouncing, it will land on the bottom. So from Earth, we could send commands to deflate the airbag in portions such that we could change the center of gravity and make it tilt over such that the bottom is actually touching the surface. And then the rest of what you saw just now happens. Rover unfolds itself. Now, this doesn't happen automatically like that. Each one of those movements happens, and we get data back at Earth to see, did it go okay? Did it go okay? <laughs> and then the next day, we do the next move. So this, uh, I think, for Spirit, it took seven days to do all that. And this is just you know, engineers and scientists being very careful. Opportunity, I think, it took 12 days. OK, so once you're off, on, off the lander, uh, what basically happens is you've got these panoramic cameras and other imagery that you can take of the uh, area. Scientists back on Earth look at that, and they start their campaign of exploration. They decide where the rover should go. Uh, once they know what the rover should do, it's handed over to engineers, such as myself, who actually look at the screens and look at the data and plan the motion of the rover, plan the activity of the robotic arm. And all, every, everybody's desires and commands have to fit into some time window during which it can actually be executed on Mars. That's sent up to the vehicle, and it executes, has a, a number of things to do throughout the whole day. And again, we don't know whether that went well until the next communications opportunity. So what is the closest on the Earth that corresponds to this surface? The closest what? Closest to this surface on the Earth. Um, you find a number of uh, interesting areas in the Mojave Desert. We used to do field tests with the rovers before uh, out there. Some areas of Montana as well. OK. Uh, this is a very, very simple or simplified and high-level view of what the operations uh, sequence is like. That's you, man. That's me, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I drew this in the form of a feedback control diagram just to you know, make it clear what's happening, really. And it really is a feedback control uh, uh, process. So you've got the science activity, a bunch of different scientists who are concerned with different things, geology, atmosphere, and so on. And they have all their various th things that they want the rover to do. Eventually, they come down to decide upon what that is. You've got engineers who work on the data that has come down already and understand the rover's capabilities, and they plan the motions of the rover. So they're, com they're sequencing commands. Uh, those command sequences, including sequences that involve science measurements uh, from the instruments that the scientists actually have come up with, they all get uploaded into a gigantic command sequence. The rovers receive them, and they autonomously execute according to the schedule uh, prescribed by the command. Once there's the next uh, communications opportunity, that information gets downlinked. It includes science data. It includes engineering data, uh, lots of image, image data. And you've got a team of folks who are actually doing engineering assessment. Data has come down. We have telemetry. We know... Uh, what the encoder count is on every motor. We know what the uh, temperature sensors are saying and everything like that. And so we can assess the health, if you will, of the system. And you've got a number of different individuals who are looking at particular systems, thermal system, power system. In my case, it was mobility and robotic arm, communication system, uh, the state of the software load on board, the memory usage, Etc. So you've got a bunch of a team of individuals who are looking at all this information, and we put forward to the planning process the best uh, knowledge that we have of the rover's health and recommendations. Uh, for example, if the rover is dri driven for about 100 meters somewhere, it takes new imagery of a new area of Mars we've never seen before, and we see, for example, uh, 
large boulders, craters here and there, a recommendation might be don't drive over there, <laughs> for example. All right, so this process continues on a daily basis uh, involving all of these individuals. I point out at the bottom here the intelligence and the autonomy that is on board the vehicles to allow that communications link to be effectively cut off and allow them to execute on their own in the meantime. And it basically consists throughout the whole loop, if you will, a combination of human intelligence coming up with the actual commands, command sequences, activities, what are we looking for, what data should we collect, and then the onboard robotic autonomy to actually move around and do that uh, data according to the sequences that are... This really up done at JPL? Yes. Yeah, um, those, uh, those images are taken at JPL. All the data comes down through the Deep Space Network, routed to JPL to what we call a mission operations center. And uh, all that data is networked uh, in a network system that distributes it to all the appropriate places, and we perform this process. So how often, often do you go good. How often do you update, uh, upload your command sequence every day? Or? Uh, yeah, every day. So it's basically a daily process. Okay. However, uh, as we got further and further into these missions, years in, right. uh, we got to the point where we were able to allow the rover to be on its own for more than a day. And so the cadence became every other day commanding and that kind of thing. Uh, command on Friday, don't, come, don't, don't worry about the rover for the weekend, and command on Monday, that sort of thing. What's the delay, communication delay from Mars to here? Uh, can it be anywhere from 7 to 14 minutes one way? And so... Uh, 20 to 45 minutes is what Yeah. Well, round, round trip. So if you, if, you, if you really want to know something that's happening, for example, when the rovers, uh, let's see, I guess this is opportunity, got wheels stuck in soil, you know, uh, uh, hub deep, and was basically immobile. And we had to extract the vehicle remotely from that situation. We would turn the wheels, thinking that it might have some effect, but not knowing until 20 minutes, 40 minutes later. Okay. We find out later, and then we send up another command immediately, and we go through this cycle of huge delays in between knowing what we've described, uh, whether it would work or not. Uh, so it's really irritating. <laughs> so the feedback control loop will be unstable, right? If you... Oh, indeed. <laughs> yeah. You don't have high bandwidth. Yeah. And so, so we move on to Mars Science Laboratory. This was a curiosity, again, an animation of the landing. I'll only show it here up to the landing part uh, since the rest is pretty similar. But this is a different landing approach. Again, a parachute to delay or to slow down the actual descent to the surface. In this case, a larger rover for which the airbag approach would not work. So a different system was designed. It was referred to as the sky crane. And as you see, it has thrusters on board and the rover attached to it. Again, it's sensing its uh, height above the, the surface, and at a certain point, we'll release the rover on a bridle to basically set it down more or less gently. It could actually take some impact from a fall if necessary, and cut the bridle, and the uh, actual sky crane flies off and lands on the surface of Mars, just crashes there. <laughs> okay. Uh, Which is the one that crashed, the Lockheed one, right? The Lockheed. Yeah, that was the... Uh, the unit problem. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, the Mars Polar Lander that I mentioned earlier was the replacement for that years later. Okay, and so similar, uh, this, now this, this rover is configured differently. Um, it can do some sample acquisition, has greater onboard processing, uh, and so far it's already, it's been, uh, had a different uh, mission design. Spirit and Opportunity were sent up there to figure out uh, or provide data on what was the uh, past history of water, if any, at the surfaces where they were landing. Uh, Curiosity was sent up to look for uh, basically any conditions for favorable microbial life, bacteria and that kind of thing. Okay, now next, in 2020, another rover will be launched to Mars. It'll look a lot like Curiosity, but it'll be particularly different in the instruments that are at the end of the arm and a lot of the things that are on board. Uh, for example, it'll have a drill on, on board, and it can take core samples, collect those samples,
put those samples into a laboratory inside its stomach, basically, which has another little small robotic arm inside to move that sample, like test tubes throughout a, a different laboratory inside. Uh, and it'll also cache or save those samples for a inevitable bar sample return mission in the future. You can check out that website if you want to learn more about it. One piece of information, I've got this question mark at the bottom. This mission is contemplating off the critical path the idea of including a rotored helicopter on the belly of the vehicle. Uh, the mission design is going forward. I'm on the review board for this. Uh, I'm mostly focused on the mobility and robotic arm, but not the helicopter. Uh, but the helicopter is being evaluated independently uh, and as a sidetrack. And at some point, a decision will be made as to whether or not the, the mission will accommodate the helicopter, and then the designs will merge and the mission will go forward. So it's still a, a, a TBD at this point. Why do you need that? Um, this one, the reason they, they would have the helicopter, it would be a technology experiment towards one, uh, will that design, as they think it would, actually fly in the thin atmosphere on Mars? And if so, uh, it'll be sort of the precursor to later missions where they know they could use that as a viable, uh, over-the-horizon type of, uh, of a system. Okay. Uh, not only for a rover, but eventually for uh, astronauts who might go to the surface. Okay. So can it take off and all that stuff? That is the intent? Yes. The intent, so can in I fact... Can go from multiple places and do... Experiments too, right? Yes. Although this technology experiment version would not be equipped with multiple instruments like you might, so it wouldn't have a complete mission. The idea is that it would be there, it would be deployed by the rover arm or a mechanism that's underneath the belly that would bring it out to the side, place it on the ground. The rover would drive probably very far away <laughs> before it gets deployed and so on. So it's really uh, in NASA parlance a technology experiment. So the technology-wise, goes are mostly developed within JPL or by other institutions, universities, or...? Uh, a combination. Uh, so the, uh, J JPL has gotten really good at certain things, and it will always t tend to do those things. And over time, it amasses collaborators who do something else really good. Uh, so, for example, the robotic arms, going back to uh, Spirit and Opportunity, uh, Curiosity, and then this vehicle, uh, were built by third-party company in California. And uh, JPL provides the requirements. Uh, they uh, build the hardware, deliver the hardware to JPL, and JPL provides the software and the controls. Um, so it's that sort of arrangement. And it's similar to so, some of the other subsystems. I saw some you cannot Cornell in one of the videos. Say again? You, you cannot Cornell University. Yeah, yeah. So is that... Well, Cornell in this particular case uh, was actually the, the PI, science PI, for the Mars Exploration Rovers mission, Spirit and Opportunity, was from Cornell. And so for almost all of these missions, there will be a science PI and probably a science uh, co-PI. Uh, these are the people who were principally involved in proposing the mission in the first place. And when the mission actually gets done by a JPL, by a NASA Ames, by whomever, they're heavily involved. And they're really driving the, the science uh, bus, if you will. Okay. Uh, as another example, the uh, spacecraft that flew to, to Pluto, that was built by APL, Applied Physics Lab, for NASA. The PI, science PI, was from SWERI. Right? So it's, uh, it's one of these kinds of things. Uh, when these missions get proposed, a science team as, comes as part of the proposal. And the science PI is really the star of the mission, so to speak. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so as I mentioned, I, I made a hint that uh, next, after Mars 2020, at some TBD point in the future, there'll be sample return. This is something that NASA has also always been moving towards and trying to get to, not just NASA, European Space Agency, other space agencies around the world. Uh, in this case, you're talking about, there's a number of different scenarios for doing this. One is one in which a previous mission has gone and collected samples. And a later mission comes with a rover that actually retrieves those samples from what is probably a dead rover, brings that, those samples back to a lander, which has the capability to launch back off the Martian surface, rendezvous with another spacecraft in Mars orbit, 
and come back to bring the sample back to Earth. That's the most common mission scenario for this. These are images from back in the early 2000s when a team of us at JPL were working on the research and technology development that would be needed for this sort of a mission. Uh, and so we had what we were calling a dead rover. We had a fetch rover that could actually retrieve samples from it, uh, use uh, computer vision to drive back to a lander, drive up a ramp, and drop off the sample, so to speak. Uh, so some of the technology for doing this is kind of ready. It's probably even better today than it was back then because we've got better perception algorithms for doing some of these things, as well as some better control algorithms. Uh, so the mission just needs to come into fruition, and the technology needs to be refined from a robotic standpoint, and we could actually probably achieve that. Okay, lunar surface exploration. I'm going to speed up now. Perception for night driving. I mentioned night driving because... Most of the intent for missions to the moon involving robots, and for that matter, humans, really is focused on the polar areas, the polar regions of uh, the moon, because those are the places where it's known to have uh, water ice. So a potential resource for astronauts, if you will, to actually sustain themselves when they're on the surface. Problem is, at the poles, the sun is very low in the sky if it's in the sky at all. There are some areas that are permanently shadowed, never ever see the sun. These are in some craters where the sun angle, if you're at the surface of the crater or at the rim of the crater, you might see way down along the horizon like a sunset all the time. But deep in the crater, the sun never uh, actually shines there. And this is where some of the, those pockets of water ice are. Uh, and so the idea then is that rovers that are operating in that type of terrain will need the ability to navigate in the dark effectively. And so right now, the only thing we've done in the past on Mars didn't need to navigate in the dark, per se. But Sojourner, this first small rover sent back in 1997, used the laser stripe projection approach to actually perceiving the terrain. Spirit and Opportunity, as I mentioned, just passive stereo vision. So they need the sunlight or some light, some illumination to actually move around. Uh, so folks have been researching night driving using flash LIDARs, other types of LIDARs. One of the issues is that they've been too large, these LiDAR sensors. Uh, so there's some developments going on trying to shrink them now. I think we're getting close to, the, to that uh, today. And there's just some of the other issues that are listed there associated with, one would have, with what one would have to surmount in order to make this viable. Other issues on the moon. There's uh, dust pockets here and there that are not perceivable by many, many of the senses that we might otherwise decide to use. Uh, let me uh, explain this using these images on the uh, right side. These are from the Viking lander back in the early 70s, uh, sent to Mars in this case. Uh, right after landing, one of the foot pads, it had three foot pads for landing. One of the foot pads was solidly on the surface. An image taken of the other foot pad showed that it had fully submerged in the surface. And this is nearby surface because the land is but so big. If you were to look at this, the terrain prior to landing, it would have looked like it should be like the top image all in that whole area. So there are these dust pockets that are hard to perceive and that are effectively mobility hazards, and for that matter, landing hazards for the types of systems that we send. And so this is something that we have to deal with some folks have proposed things like millimeter wave radar in order to see beneath the surface to a certain depth and understand whether or not the soil consistency is uh, as uniform as it is in other areas as a means of look-ahead sensing, because you don't want to sense it after you've <laughs> stepped in it, so to speak. Uh, so that's one of the issues. And this uh, is sort of pervasive throughout a lot of the planetary environments. Uh, Mars Pathfinder, so this is Mars now, seeing similar sort of drift material as I mentioned, uh, this is an image, in fact, from when uh, Opportunity's wheels got stuck in the soil. And we had to do that consecutive commanding uh, action in order to understand what was going on when we tried new things. OK, not sure what happened there. No? No, it's not there either. 
Okay, sorry about this, folks. Ah, uh, that's what it is. Look at that. Well, I think that's going to come back up. I'll continue. Let's see here. Probably have. So where was I? <laughs> right, 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 right. So, so there, there's a lot of other issues on the moon. Uh, the night driving. There's the soil uh, that that you have to deal with in terms of your perception system systems, and so on. Uh, it also is the case that um, you're dealing with temperatures that are very, very, very low. In some of those areas at the poles, for example, the lunar night is on order of weeks. Right? A couple of weeks of lunar night. Uh, and so you have to survive very low extreme temperatures for long periods of time. Uh, and then if you're going to operate down inside a crater, you have to have the, the mobility to actually get down there and get back out. Preferably, all right. So there's a lot of issues on the moon. So talking further about the moon and Mars, here's another thought to leave you with. There's a lot of desire for getting beneath the surfaces of planets. Of planets, to actually a lot of the high priority science, for example, is beneath the surface. One way to do it is to drill, and a lot of different designs have been. Uh, derived from the way we drill into soil on Earth. Most of them are massive, require lots of power, and for the most part are not very feasible. I did mention that the Mars 2020 rover will have, have a drill, relatively small drill, capable of doing core samples of a very small, finite depth. But to get appreciably beneath the surface, we currently have no solution that is actually viable to fly on a particular mission. And so if we look at nature, you know, you've seen these things, so perhaps... And they're pretty capable. They, <laughs> they build these uh, or dig these, these networks of, uh, of tunnels beneath the surfaces on many places on our planet. And I've always asked this question, can we mimic that in a robotic electromechanical system? Uh, I've never had an opportunity to work on this, but I did have an opportunity to propose this to a mechanical engineering senior design class <laughs> at Johns Hopkins University. And... Uh, they came up with the design. It still needs some work, however. Let's see here. <clears throat> OK. And so this was sort of the goal that I presented to them. And I even wanted this vehicle to be able to uh, turn, basically steer, beneath the surface, although with a very large radius of curvature. That was fine. And so they came up with this particular prototype and tested it in some, uh, you know, uh, shipping uh, packaging peanuts, you know, as soil, um, just to show that something, whether it would work to some degree. If I can actually see in this here. Oops, I didn't mean to do that. I'm not, there we go. Okay, so it's got a head that swivels as well as drills, if you will, and it's got some fins in the back because you've got to do something with the dirt that you've excavated, all right? And this worked in the laboratory test bed that they used, but it was too heavy, uh, and ultimately it has a lot of other design uh, desirements that you really need to, to deal with, but it was a start. And that's kind of where the project left off. There are some folks in Europe who are working on this as well, and they've made a bit more progress. Um, but I lay that out as a challenge to any mechanical engineering folks uh, who might want to consider this type of problem and see if you can't come up with an interesting design. When you look at the mole rats, uh, that's one of the things that you, you can imagine you should be able to do. Uh, this one here, lava tubes, skylights. You see them all over the surfaces of the moon as well as Mars. These are holes in the ground 
that connect directly to channels. And there's lots of interesting science that people are sure are beneath those surfaces. And there's, these holes are providing ready access. And so the idea is, how can you get robotic technology can act, that can actually move down in those uh, areas and do exploration missions? So how are they made? Do you, do you have people now? Say again? How are those things made in Mars, those caves? Ah, so that's, that's the subject of a, that's a science question. Right. It's not sure. So in the case of lava tubes, it's known that, it's, that lava has done it from past uh, geological processes. But in other cases, like skylights, it's not clear. This is a design that NASA Goddard had come up with. They had also been talking about it for military applications. That's why you see some of the camouflage on this prototype. But the way that this vehicle locomotes is interesting and could be something like the type of thing one might think about for trying to get into these types of uh, environments. You get the idea. I'm almost out of time, so I want to go ahead and, and move forward, right? But that's pretty cool, right? But it's a challenging, a very challenging problem, trying to deal with uh, insides of caves, underground. Your comms is all messed up and everything. You don't really have a path to the outside, and it would be nice if you could to exit out of the same hole you entered into, <laughs> if you want to bring some data back to some place. Uh, another area folks are thinking about these days is how do you, perhaps if you don't send more, uh, astronauts to the surface of the Mars, maybe you send them to orbit and they've got effectively what's like a space station, but there are robots on the surface that they can teleoperate uh, since they're so close and uh, do exploration for them. We've done some work um, that's unrelated initially uh, at EPL where we were dealing with explosive ordnance disposal. Uh, teleoperated vehicles that were highly dexterous uh, and could actually do something like this with a low latency telecommunications link, um, which basically is the same sort of mission concept. On the bottom uh, right left here, we actually have an experiment we tried um, doing some surface sampling with the same type of system on a different mobile base, uh, basically looking at we have a, a means to configure the network to be delay tolerant as well as to uh, impose the time delay between Earth and the moon, uh, Earth and, uh, and uh, low Earth orbit, and that kind of thing, and show that we could actually do some meaningful teleoperation over those time delays. Okay, so I won't go through the rest. I'll stop here. I'm going to page through. People can see the slides and imagine. <laughs> and uh, we'll go ahead and leave it there. So Europa, we're talking about an underwater ocean. Uh, asteroids and comets. Uh, the closest we've got is we ended a orbiting mission at an asteroid by landing on the asteroid, crash landing basically to end the mission. But we haven't actually moved around. Uh, some of the other missions have happened since then uh, to comets and so forth. Um, this is the last image from that near spacecraft that was crash landed to end this mission. That gives you the soccer ball is there for scale. Uh, so you see the fine features. You could imagine something landing on that surface and actually moving around. The variability on one asteroid, smooth surfaces, rocky surfaces. The various size differences between the various asteroids that are out there. Some are small, some are huge. Getting around on an asteroid. Many, many of them, because of their oblong shape or otherwise irregular shape, have uh, non-uniform gravitational fields. So if you try to orbit around them, you're probably not going in any lips. <laughs> and then uh, getting onto the surface, if you want to get around by walking, it's probably not feasible. Uh, every reaction you put against the surface will actually move you up into the air, potentially. Uh, so hopping ballistically is one approach. Uh, but also gripping onto the surface is another approach. So there have been systems that have been worked on that actually working on systems that I can, think, I can grip the surface and move around, uh, upside down in this case, uh, or by just using forced closure uh, by sticking uh, elements into the, the, the surface soil. Mercury and Venus, an APL spacecraft finished mapping Mercury finally. We had never had a full map of Mercury all these years. In some of that information, they found uh, what is probably water ice at the poles. Mercury, closest to the sun, who would have thought? So some folks are thinking about what to do about that. 
Uh, European Space Agency has a concept they derive from a different asteroid-related mission for getting robots around on the surface of Mercury, but tethered to a lander. Venus surface is extremely hot, but there's a mission concept coming out of NASA uh, Glenn uh, involving a spacecraft, an aerial vehicle, and a rover that can survive practically melting temperatures. And we've been at it for a long time. There have been roadmaps after roadmap after roadmap. In the roadmaps, the problems don't really change much because we don't solve them quickly enough. And so uh, you can look at almost any one. This is one of the latest ones that are out there. You can find it on the internet. And some of the technologies, these uh, uh, needs that are out there, you can uh, read them there. I added these at the bottom. Um, I had an opportunity to give feedback at National Academies uh, on this roadmap to the folks who wrote the roadmap. And I suggested, you know, these things at the bottom. Uh, again, thinking about long-duration missions, we want systems that can, whose hardware can degrade and they can continue to learn and maximize their functionality as time goes by. All right. That's my last slide, I believe. I'll leave it there. Thank you. And sorry for going over time. Great talk. We have uh, one or two short questions. I answered them all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is there any research being done on uh, defining similar projects which, are, which could be commercialized so that to advance those technologies uh, by like, companies that they could make money out of a business plan that they could advance these technologies that are needed in these projects? You said, so or has there been any work, you said? Yeah, any research. Research make these technology needed for these projects uh, commercialized so that yeah. like private sector would be able to push these technologies at a high temperature or um, high radiation. Sure. So I, I, I would have to say yes, maybe indirectly, not always directly. Uh, so for almost everything NASA does, especially large, huge mission-wise, uh, there's always some interest in making things dual use. Uh, and NASA has programs like its, its spin-offs program, which tries to take technologies from all of its missions and propose, if you will, prescribe how some of them could be used. Uh, small companies and large alike, I believe, have the opportunity to uh, leverage on some of those things. They can actually get uh, significant depth of the technology uh, details, in many cases, to apply to their products and their, 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 their services. Uh, so I, I would say this is some, the sort of thing that's kind of built into NASA, at least. I'm not sure about how the other uh, international space agencies handle that. Um, so I'll say indirectly uh, yes to your question. Well, it took uh, three-legged lander to get out of the quicksand. Uh, it didn't. So the good thing is that it was uh, a lander, so therefore it wasn't going anywhere. And so they had to do the rest of the mission they with it basically like this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there were no mechanisms on it to actually uh, come, recover from that. Yeah. So there's a the last one. Okay. So yeah. So what what is the percentage you think of of uh, input from the ground where they where the rover is actually taking taking direction versus autonomous decision making that the rover is seeing something and responding to it? Good question. Uh, so. There's an evolution of this trade-off, um, most of it being driven by constraints of the mission. Like, uh, okay, we want to drive some 200 meters today. Um, we know that if we start this drive and finish it fully autonomously, it's going to take forever, <laughs> right? Because the rover's got to sense, decide, move, and cycle through that, which all takes processing power on pretty slow computers, right? So the trade-off becomes, okay, well, with the data that we have, we can see pretty confidently the hazards that are on the terrain out to 30, 40 meters. So we're going to plan for the rover waypoints. Go here, here, here until you get out to 50 meters and then turn on your autonomy. So it trades off almost every day depending on the situation. Uh, so it's hard to put a hard number on really what the, what the percentage is, but the, quick, the best answer is probably uh, that the best task allocation is done for the constraints of the day. Cool. 
Okay, so, okay, weather hazards is a big problem in, a, another, pro, in another planet. So is there any auto, uh, independent program that running that if a storm appears uh, immediately like a pack, uh, protect yourself or protect your uh, panels or something? Right. No. No. <laughs> At least not yet. And, and so, can't protect, uh, predict, uh, predict everything uh, concerning the weather. You can't. That's right. That's right. So the best that we could do in, in what we, the best we have done so far is take everything we know and can potentially speculate about the environment and build these systems to withstand them. Now, that doesn't always happen. As you say, you can't predict. And so, um, yeah, some systems have failed. Um, but sometimes it, it, those things help you, too. For example, uh, for Spirit and Opportunity, um, they were supposed to run a mission for about three months. That was all based on what we knew about solar panel coverage with dust from the Sojourner mission. We figured that by about three months, they, they would be pretty, pretty covered and, and less effective, and the mission would probably not go on much longer. But dust storms periodically blew off the dust. And that is really one of the primary reasons why the rovers are still going, other mechanical issues aside. Uh, so, yeah, you can't predict it, but we've learned a lot more. And so subsequent systems will, again, be built to endure the environment. Um, but in terms of reactions, safeguarding, I think we'll have to wait a bit for the more of the very intelligent robots of the future. <laughs> That's officially closed. the seminar. But if you have a few questions, you can ask after the officially closed. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.